Forest of Bliss, Rushes. Cambridge, Massachusetts, April 1985. I am about to begin viewing the footage of Forest of Bliss, the working title I'm using for the film that I have just shot in India. Often, when I look at a film I've shot, I'm able to recall much about the day, even the instant I was looking through the camera's viewfinder. Such recollections are sometimes quite detailed. I might remember, for example, what I was wearing or had had for breakfast, what persons were with me, and what we said to each other. I think there is little question that innocent fragments of sensory actuality can evoke a whole array of memories. In the account that follows, I will try to make use of this striking property of film to recover what I was feeling and thinking as I worked. In 1961, when I was planning work in New Guinea, I had not yet formulated a working distinction between fact and truth, document and insight, observation and vision. This accounts for the tension I now see between the requirements of science and of art in my film Dead Birds. In Benares I expected to be free of those kinds of concerns, and yet, quite apart from the almost purely acrobatic matter of inserting oneself bodily into the crowded alleyways, there was the conceptual predicament of how to make sense of the chaos I saw in Benares as a whole. The footage I am looking at was shot on the 11th of December, 1984, soon after getting to Benares. I think it might even be the next day. I cannot be sure because I have also lost the little diary in which I noted my whereabouts on a daily basis. These first shots are of a man rowing me in his boat down the river. There are close-up details of the oars as they rotate in the makeshift oar locks. Other shots show the blades of the oars going into the water. Sometimes one sees in the background rather obscurely and a little out of focus the city of Benares on the west bank. The east bank is largely deserted. From the time I first began thinking of making a film of Benares, a boatman was an essential figure in the larger landscape. Boats and boatmen put me in mind of my own mythology, of the Styx, of crossing a river and getting to the farther shore. The scene I am watching is of Manakanakagat. It is actually about 300 feet south, where a carpenter is filling holes in the bottom of an old boat with new pieces of wood. I am trying to convey an idea of what goes on behind and beyond the boat. I want the boat in some way to stand for redemption. After all, it is being reborn, remade, reconstituted. Beyond this boat is one of the most powerful locales in the vast and sacred geography of India. This is where Vishnu used his discus to dig an enormous hole that was then filled with the sweat of Krishna's asceticism. Now it is a place of utmost sanctity for millions of practicing Hindus, but especially for those who come here on pilgrimage, or simply to die. I remember this day very well. I had felt extremely lucky to find this particular work in such close proximity to Manakanakagat and to be able to use it to distance the immediate immensities of the burning ground. The stairways themselves are also an important visual motif. I had decided long before coming that steps would be important indicators of transition between life and death as much as between the river and the city. One goes down the stairways to reach the river, and up to reach the city. They also lead, of course, to the cremation ground. This is the first effort I've made to work with steps, but I'm sure there will be many more such images in this footage. Anyway, these steps are being cleaned off, and I think this material has some promise. As I watch this roll of film, I see that I am working on the theme of steps all the time. For example... A few birds are hopping about on some. A dead dog is lying in shallow water at the bottom of others. I also see boys with reels of string who are flying kites from other steps. At Harish Chandra Ghat, boats are unloading sand that has been dug up on the far shore, sailed across the river and unloaded. This is an almost Mesopotamian scene of big barges filled with sand and then emptied by people carrying it in baskets down a gangplank and up an embankment of yet more steps. 
There it is thrown onto a huge pile that is constantly added to and subtracted from as it gets used throughout the city. My images are simply portrayals of this oddly absorbing scene. In the editing, I may try to use the material to indicate the idea of the father's shore. For me, sand has a distinct association with time, termination, and death, as in expressions like the sands of time and the sands are running out. In the scenes I'm watching, there is an added surrealism of what look like colonies of human beings picking up one bank of a river and depositing it on the other. It is ant-like, relentless, and unvarying. Bamboo was another motif I had wanted to pursue since first noticing that the litters carrying the corpses were made from it. I tried to develop this idea in several ways. I found a carpentry shop where litters were made and spent considerable time there. Later on, I was alert to the use of bamboo in many contexts. I wanted to use those images the same way I would use marigolds, wood, and sand. I am on the eastern shore in the early morning, and a dog is busily gnawing meat off unidentifiable ribs. I think they are animal and not human. There are more scenes of carrying sand onto the sand barges. After this sequence, there emerges a marvelous scene of dogs fighting early in the morning on the same farther shore. I am certain this will be an image somewhere near the beginning of the film may be setting up the whole idea of dogs as guardians of the gates to the other world. A boy is flying a kite at Manakarnaka Ghat and is tossed by the thermal updrafts from the funeral fires. It was always tantalizing to shoot the kites. They are extremely small objects in a vast sky, and by the time I had framed the shot and found the focus, they were usually gone. The working title of the film from the time I first began thinking of one, has been Forest of Bliss. Filming something on the gathering of wood to be used at the cremation ground seemed to resonate nicely with this title. Obviously, the title is meant to convey more than the simple meaning of the words. I have in mind all the wonderful ambiguities of a forest and of bliss. A forest is enchanting and also forbidding. Bliss is joy and a danger. The cremation ground is sometimes called forest of bliss in the sacred text. I think my pleasure in this title comes from the suggestion of both a place and a state of mind. Forests can be intimidating, and so the idea of a forest of bliss is, for me, a strangely entrancing notion. I seem to have made many shots of wood being dumped in the ground, dragged out of trucks, and piled onto people's heads. The background noise level is very high, but I think it is faithful to what was going on at the time. Now there's a shot of a boy running along the steps. I remember asking him to do that, just to have something happen. He runs back towards the camera, and then down to the edge of the river. I think this is the only time I propose that someone do something. I'm near the water tower, close to Asigat. I can hear the pump in the tower going like crazy. A man is cooking his meal at the very edge of the river. His whole life is spread out before him, and he seems about to fall into the water. The sound of the pumps nearby is very strange. The next scenes are of little girls playing hopscotch in a courtyard just outside a temple near our house. I'd seen them through the window and wanted to work with them, partly because I have been told that hopscotch is a cosmic game, like getting into heaven by playing parcheesi, or chess for that matter. Hopscotch must be another version of a diagrammatic path to the realms above and beyond. Most importantly, I thought it was a charming game, especially the way these girls played it. Abstruse symbolism is not what matters in film. The next scene is of an old blind man coming down a wide stairway, knocking at each step with his stick as he comes, talking to somebody that passes by. The steps are otherwise empty, and he's just feeling his way along with his stick. The stick defines the steps. Next there is a shot of a cow eating marigolds, something I was always watching for. This image communicated the whole idea of life recycling. 
The garbage and trash gets reborn in the digestive systems of the dogs, cats, cows, water buffaloes, and everything else that creeps, crawls, and flies. I went back several times to the Mukti Bhavan, hoping to find people washing the floor. Finally, I think I had to say, please don't wash the floor until I get there. Every morning, whether or not somebody had died, the floor would be washed. I had missed this five-minute event on several different days, but this time they managed to wait for me. The first part of this camera roll has shots of a man splashing water on the floor and then washing it with a broom. In the background, the attendants are chanting their almost continuous round of devotional songs. The chanting is quite loud and almost overwhelms the sound of water being splashed on the floor and the brooms spreading it around. Next, I'm filming a sequence of ritual activities that took no more than 10 or 15 minutes of real time. Everything was unfolding very quickly and with great novelty for me. A corpse is brought down the stairs in the Mukti Bhavan. The body had to be one of the three resident ladies, but I wasn't sure which. Everything, such as the kinds of things gotten to prepare her for her final journey, indicates for this funeral there is very little money. The corpse has been wrapped in a simple white cotton shroud with only one small scrap of silk draped over it. I've seen other bodies literally festooned with yards of this gaudy stuff. This corpse has only one string of marigolds and a few lonely sticks of incense. I see that it is the day of the relaunching of the boat whose repair I have been filming for some time. The men are gathering the ingredients necessary for blessing the boat. The main figures in this little drama are the boatman owner, the carpenter, and his assistant. It's really they who are doing the ritual, and who, curiously, appear to know what they are doing. As I indicated earlier, I wanted this sequence about the boat to suggest something more than a repair. It was also to be the rebirth of an important element of life in Benares. I wanted this repairing and relaunching to help redeem things such as death, corruption, and chaos. Here was a boat that must have had a busy history and has been brought ashore to be remade. Finally the time has come when it is ready to be a boat again. I like the idea of the boat launching to be happening next to the cremation ground where the dead are about to take another kind of voyage. Boat and people are actually at a place where each will make a crossing. The boat will be going to the farther shore, which is what these bodies are also doing, it's believed. I didn't know the carpenter was going to do a puja before launching the boat. For days the men had been saying they would launch it the next day, and of course they were never quite ready to do that. But when I arrived on this day, they were ready, and I even think they had been waiting for me since I had been asking them so many times about it. Since starting the filming of this boat, I tried to play the foreground off against the background. Today the boat is being given a new life, and the dead bodies are headed for eternity. Someone looking at these shots of the boat might not actually see what's happening in the background where hundreds of people are bringing their dead to be burned. The scene is extraordinarily busy, but is also quite far away. At the moment, when the boat is actually launched, a joyful procession comes down the ghats bearing a richly decorated corpse. At this point, it is pretty clear what is happening at the cremation ground. Roll number 45 begins in the gullies near the huge wood pile you pass to get to the river. People are splitting and piling up wood. A lady is collecting cow dung to make fuel patties, and a man is sweeping up around where he weighs out the wood. A radio is blasting in the background incessantly. In these Manakarnika scenes, there's always a radio, producing either music or a cricket match. The next sequence is of the weighing out of a load of wood. What I saw in this image was a suggestion of equivalence in a human being to a measure of wood, to a certain volume and weight of wood. After the wood is weighed, it is piled on a helper's head and brought down to be stacked at one of the empty positions on the cremation ground. Then a body is put on the pyre, a little more wood is put on the body, and sacred fire is used to touch it off. I'm trying to pull an exposure out of nowhere. It's so early in the morning the sun hasn't come up. Mitai Lal manages to just barely move, making his way in a gingerly fashion down the steps and through the gullies, groaning every foot of the way. Finally, the light is better. Every once in a while there is a dog in the frame, 
which greatly pleases me. The far side of the Ganges can also sometimes be seen. Camerol number 52, also shot on the 19th of January, has more of Mittailal bathing in the river. And then on his way home, up the steps of the Ghat. Mittailal is in a genial mood this morning. I suspect that he is most mornings, but this one especially. As he goes up the steps, he is laughing and clowning with passers-by. He takes a great interest in whomever he sees and in what he's doing. Mittailal may be infirm, but he has his wits about him. He performs small worships as he goes back up to his house. The progress is slow and not self-conscious. The images of Mittailal are quite telling in the way they reveal Hindu faith. It's a soft and gentle series of gestures arising from one man's daily devotions. I see that I'm again trying here and at other times to make steps and stairways a visual motif. I'm showing human and animal feet on steps, steps being swept, slept on, and prayed on. People lie dead on steps, bang their heads and go into trance on them. Steps are part of a threshold of a transition to another space or another time. I'm really asking that they be a figure that embraces the notion of going to another realm, that of the Father's shore. I'm starting to look at role number 66. It is a scene of a body being taken down an alleyway. There is no sound, probably because it was one of the frequent occasions on which I was alone. All the time I was in Benares, I was certain that cinema verite was not an appropriate way to work. I feel this whenever I'm working but in Benares I felt it even more strongly. There are much richer and more suggestive possibilities doing sound and image separately. Camera roll number 70 begins with a journey of a boat loaded with wood. This is the day I got on one of the wood barges at Rajgat and went down the river with it to Manakarnika. The details, the different angles, the glimpses of the river, and what's going on at the river's edge will be useful in editing. Later in this role, there's a series of dead animals being brought down the steps at Dashishwamid. A donkey, a cat, and a dog are simply and casually dragged down the steps to be pitched into the Ganges. Nota bene. The reels with the wild footage, the one shot when I was alone, and no sound being recorded, contain the visual heart of this filmmaking effort. I will not attempt to describe these scenes because there are too many and they are too varied in content. I will just keep looking at them in an attempt to learn them as if they were a new vocabulary.